1 Peter 2 verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. In Peter's writings, the Bible refers to Christians as newborn babes. Just as no one enters the world as a fully developed adult, spiritual growth begins at birth. When you become a Christian, you start as a spiritual infant and gradually mature. This concept alone could inspire an entire sermon. We will be held responsible for nurturing the spiritual infants who join the family of God within our churches and at our altars. During my nearly 12 years of pastoring, I learned not to expect too much from spiritual babies, as they are not yet capable of much on their own. However, it is our responsibility to support them. Too often, when someone accepts Christ on a Sunday night, any misstep they make before Wednesday is quickly noticed and discussed by the congregation. People expect them to live a perfect Christian life by midweek, despite the fact that it took many years for others to reach that level of maturity. Years ago, I conducted a two-week revival for a specific minister. Although we could have extended the meeting, I chose to conclude it early. The auditorium, which seated 800, was filled to capacity each night, and people were responding positively. While we focused more on teaching and praying for the sick than on evangelism, on one Saturday night, 33 adults came forward to accept salvation. As I prayed with them and guided them in their prayers, I sent them to the prayer room for further support while I continued to minister to those in need of healing. What struck me most about that evening was that many of the 33 individuals who sought salvation were young married couples, likely between the ages of 25 and 32. I later discovered that none of them had ever been Christians or belonged to any church. I approached the pastor after the service to inquire about the young individuals who had attended. He replied, None of the 33 were backsliders. They were all sinners seeking salvation. This struck me as unusual, so I asked if he recognized any of them. He responded, I don't know any of them. They've never been to my church before. Curious, I followed up with, Did you collect their names and addresses? He shrugged and said, Oh, brother, I just believe if they're truly interested, they'll return. No need to worry about them. I mentioned, I'm wrapping up the meeting tomorrow night. I emphasize that people are like newborns. They require attention. These individuals had never set foot in that church or heard any full gospel preaching before. They needed follow-up, prayer, conversation, and guidance. They were spiritual infants. After a prominent healing evangelist held a meeting in a particular city, a cooperating pastor confided in me. I'm never participating in another citywide event again. Not a single one. I asked. Why not? He replied. I didn't gain a single person from it. Not one member. It was completely unhelpful. Really? I probed. Did you collect any information from those who came to the altar? Oh, yes, he admitted. They provided me with some cards, but none of them ever returned. Conversely, I spoke with another pastor in the same town about the same event, and he said, We welcomed 29 new members from that meeting. I wish he would come back. Intrigued, I asked, How did you manage that? How did they end up at your church? He explained, They didn't know anything about us. I got their cards and visited them. I didn't just encourage them to join our church. I insisted they find a good full gospel church and continue their journey with God. Some chose to come to ours. We bear the responsibility for spiritual infants. They lack knowledge and cannot fend for themselves. Just like a newborn in the physical world, they are helpless. They can't walk, dress themselves, or do anything independently. Innocence The first thing that draws you to a baby is its pure innocence. People often say, Oh, you sweet little innocent one. No one considers a baby to have a history. It simply doesn't possess one. Here's an interesting thought. If you are a newborn in Christ, your past is wiped clean. 
You might have lived a life filled with negativity or made poor choices, but once you are born again, you transform into a new creation in Christ Jesus, free from any past. God sees you as that innocent little babe. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Creation old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Innocence is a trait that, while often associated with the early stages of Christianity, is something we should strive to retain throughout our lives. Holding on to this innocence is crucial. Without it, we risk falling prey to negativity and losing our spiritual footing. New believers embody a refreshing simplicity, brimming with faith and an eagerness to learn. It's essential to nurture that teachable attitude. However, as we age, we sometimes develop a know-it-all mindset, adopting an attitude that suggests we can't be taught anything new. This mentality can isolate us, making it difficult for anyone, even God, to reach us. I recall a time when a group of men congregated at the back of the auditorium after a service at one of the churches I led. As I approached to greet them, one of the deacons asked, Brother Hagen, what are your thoughts on? And he brought up a specific biblical topic, clearly intending to draw me into their conversation. I replied, I'm not sure where your discussion stands, so I don't know if I can contribute. Just then, the man the deacon aimed to assist interjected. Let me clarify. No one can teach me anything about that topic. I know everything there is to know. I responded. If that's true, then you surpass me and every other preacher I've encountered. He insisted. I know it all. No one can enlighten me. Yet, the reality was that this individual was the most uninformed person in the church. He lacked true understanding. It's vital to keep an open heart and a willingness to learn, maintaining both an innocent and teachable spirit towards God and others. Ignorance Our two children have grown up and started families of their own. Watching our little ones and grandchildren, I've come to realize something important. Babies seem to believe that everything within their reach is meant to be tasted. A newborn instinctively puts their hands in their mouth. As they grow and begin to crawl, anything they find, a screw, a spoon, or even a spider, ends up in their mouth. Babies are unaware of the dangers around them. They don't distinguish between what is safe to eat and what isn't, and this ignorance can have dire consequences. Tragically, some babies have lost their lives because they didn't recognize something as harmful. I recall a heartbreaking incident involving a 14-month-old who, while crawling, discovered some spoiled food left behind, possibly by an older sibling. Before medical help could arrive, the child passed away. An autopsy later confirmed the food was toxic. The parents returned home to find remnants of the food in a rarely used room. The little one had no idea that it was unsafe to eat. He simply didn't understand the potential harm. What's the takeaway here? The same principle applies to our spiritual lives. We must be vigilant about what we allow into our spiritual selves. Just as we are cautious about our physical diet, we should be equally discerning about what we consume intellectually and spiritually. Many Christians unknowingly accept harmful doctrines that can poison their spiritual well-being, diminish their faith, and tarnish their witness. Years ago, a denominational minister experienced a profound encounter with the Holy Spirit that transformed his life. I can confidently say that he was one of the most effective soul winners I've ever seen in any church. His ability to lead people to salvation was remarkable. He could reach hearts when others struggled. It felt like you could gather the 12 best preachers in America to deliver their messages and extend altar calls, yet he could take the same audience and lead more souls to Christ than all of them combined after their initial attempts. His ministry was distinctly evangelistic. However, over time, he began to explore misleading teachings and eventually embraced false doctrines, which led him astray. If he has brought even one soul to Christ in the last 20 years, I'm not aware of it, and neither is anyone else. 
I also know several boring again, spirit-filled individuals who were once effective in winning souls and leading others to the Holy Spirit. Yet, they became distracted by certain doctrines. Some even claimed, God is doing something different these days. But that's simply not true. God's mission to save souls remains unchanged. They have just strayed from the core truths of Scripture and pursued ideas that hold no real value. There are indeed some beliefs that can be harmful in themselves, while others are non-essential to salvation, meaning it doesn't matter whether one believes in them or not. Unfortunately, many Christians tend to consume a variety of teachings that stray from the truth, leading to spiritual toxicity. This can result in them guiding others down the same misguided path. When the Spirit of God is at work, He seeks unity among believers. Ephesians 4 verse 13 emphasizes this, stating, Until we all reach unity in the faith, anything that causes division among Christians is not from the Spirit of God. It originates from the enemy. The Spirit of love fosters unity, not division. I once visited a Christian household and noticed some books on the living room table that I recognized as harmful. Although they were religious texts, they carried a toxic influence. It's important to be cautious not only with secular literature, but also with religious writings. I intentionally steered the conversation toward these books and picked one up to comment on it. The individual I was speaking with was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and they exclaimed, Oh, that's a fantastic book. Is it really? I replied. Absolutely, they affirmed. In the early stages of my Christian journey, I had encountered similar books and quickly identified their harmful nature. I flipped to specific pages and began reading excerpts aloud. Well, Brother Hagen, they reference chapter and verse in there. I checked some of them, and those verses are indeed in the Bible. Of course, I responded. If they didn't include some scripture, albeit often taken out of context, people wouldn't bother reading it. Just like if you were trying to poison a dog, you wouldn't offer just the poison. You'd disguise it in something appealing. Do you understand my point? The devil can use good scripture to lure you in, but he'll mix in a bit of poison. Be discerning about what you read. Avoid consuming everything you come across. Unless you are a fully mature Christian capable of discerning truth from error, it's wise to steer clear of such materials. Years ago, I conducted a meeting for a full gospel minister, a highly educated man with a doctorate in divinity. I had never seen a personal library as extensive as his, with hundreds of volumes stretching from floor to ceiling. As a book lover, I was eager to explore his collection and spent three weeks reading some of his books during my stay. During one of our conversations, he candidly shared, Brother Hagen, I want to be honest with you. There are certain things I've come across that I truly wish I hadn't. They trouble me and hold me back, even though I no longer engage with them. He went on to name a few of these titles, all of which were religious in nature. He expressed, I just regret having read them. They obstruct my faith today and make it harder for me to trust in God. It would have been wiser for him to have avoided letting those ideas settle in his mind. Unfortunately, he did not. Whenever I encounter material that drains my faith rather than bolstering it, I wisely choose to set it aside immediately. It's crucial to be mindful of what you consume. There's a popular saying regarding physical nutrition. You are what you eat. The same principle applies to our spiritual lives. You are what you read. Irritability. Babies can be easily spoiled, and when they are, they often become fussy. It's surprisingly simple to indulge them to the point where they need constant attention, and they quickly get used to being held and coddled. After all, they are just babies. However, the Bible has something to say about the growth of children. David expressed, Surely I have behaved and quieted myself, like a weaned child with his mother. My soul is like a weaned child. Psalm 131 verse 2 Similarly, regarding Isaac, it is written, And the child grew, and was weaned, 
and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Genesis 21 verse 8 This should be a momentous occasion, the day when Christians mature enough to move beyond the basics. Yet, it often isn't celebrated as it should be. Instead of a day of joy, it can feel more like a day of lament. Having pastored for nearly 12 years, I understand why some of our churches struggle to thrive. When a new believer arrives, we often find ourselves without the resources to nurture them, as the older members cling to their comforts. The spiritual nursery is full, and the more mature members are reluctant to step aside. In my last church, there were two women living next to each other who, despite having been saved and filled with the Holy Spirit for quite some time, remained quite immature in their faith. They were like the biggest babies, constantly needing attention and reassurance. They would skip church on Sundays just to have someone come over and give them the affection they craved. I recently made the decision to step away. When one of the deacons brought it up, I told him, Brother, if you feel inclined to visit them, go ahead. But as for me, I won't be returning there. Honestly, trying to teach those old souls was futile. So, I stopped visiting them altogether and didn't enter their homes for the remaining 18 months of my pastoral tenure. Interestingly, once they realized I wouldn't be back, they became more committed to attending church than ever before. We should strive for spiritual maturity to the point where we no longer need someone to come and uplift us, pray for us, or provide us with constant support. Instead, we should be out there helping others. When the time comes to move on from our dependence, we should embrace it. A properly weaned child will naturally turn away from the bottle when the time is right. If not, you'll have a situation on your hands. If you can keep people on the basics, they will grow. As Peter said, Desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. I've had pastors tell me, in an attempt to caution me about giving their congregations too much. Now, Brother Hagen, I know my congregation should be more mature, but you have to be cautious. They can only handle a little milk. That's all I ever give them. I responded, No, you haven't even provided them with milk. After 30 years in this role, if they had been receiving milk, they would have grown. Peter said we would grow from it. The truth is, they didn't grow, which means they weren't even getting milk. They were just getting blue john, milk with all the cream removed. Babies are easily frustrated, distracted, and hurt. The Lord wants to bring us to the place where we're not so easily frustrated. He wants to bring us to the place where we're not so easily distracted. He wants to bring us to the place where we're not so easily hurt.